Hey friends, this is Michael Bohm with Youth Apologetics Training. Today, we're going to start a new series. We're going to be talking about the beliefs of Islam. And uh, this is going to be an interesting series. We're just going to try to, I'm going to try as much as I can to stick to the topic. There are so many rabbit trails I can follow Islam has been around since the 7th century, guys, so they have a long time, they've had a long time to put their belief system together, develop traditions, and um, writings, accumulate writings. For example, we have the Quran. All of you guys have heard of the Quran. I, I guarantee every single one of you have heard of that. That's their holy book. It's got 114 surahs, which would be similar to, oh boy, uh, kind of like chapters, 114 chapters. None of them uh, seem, the entire Quran doesn't seem to be put in any particular order. It's actually very confusing. There is no uh, order. It's, it's a lot of chaos, honestly. You can't really follow from one chapter to the next. But anyway... Gosh, see, I'm already getting caught on rabbit trails here. The Quran, you guys have heard of that. They also have a nine-volume set of books called the Hadith. And the Hadith is also uh, apparently quotations by Muhammad. Now, all these quotations are quotations collected by people who were around him, like his wives, for example. One of his wives, Aisha wrote down many of his sayings. Aisha, uh, he married when she was six and consummated the marriage when, when she was nine. Um, she had a long time to spend with Muhammad, and she wrote down a lot of his sayings. And so there's a large section of that collection of writings from her. These are all writings that were written down on things like bone fragments, palm leaves, uh, bark, you name it. Basically, whatever was there at the time to write on, whatever they could collect. And sometimes it was written on papyrus. It didn't matter. It was just whatever was there at the time to write on. And they put all these writings together in the Hadith. And so they also consider this Hadith inspired by Allah. So anyway, we've got this huge collection of various um, sources that we can get Islamic doctrine. We also have all kinds of Islamic sects. Uh, the main two that you guys have all heard about are the Sunnis and the Shiites. And I'm not even going to talk about them a whole lot during this series either. Hopefully someday I can do some more and talk about different facets of Islam because there's so much to talk about. But in this series, I'm going to pretty much just introduce you to the subject. There are people out there like Rick Warren, who is a false teacher. I'm just going to come out and say it, who teaches that uh, well, he's all into this whole Chrislam movement. He teaches that the Muslims worship the same God as Christians and Jews. And that's absolutely false. And we'll, we'll show that. I'll demonstrate that during the series. That is absolutely 100% false. And you would expect a guy of Rick Warren's caliber, somebody of that stature, to understand that. Either he's very confused or he's deceiving people. Anyway, there are movements amongst the quote-unquote church that are trying to say that Islam worships the same God as the Christians and Muslims. That is absolutely false, and we're going to talk about their beliefs. I'm going to take them directly from uh, Islamic authoritative websites. We're going to look at their official statement of faith, basically, and we'll go through that. Then we're going to talk about their terms and definitions, because as usual, and I love doing this when we do introductions to different uh, movements, there are so many movements out there that use Christian ease. <laughs> they use Christian terminology uh, in, in uh, many different contexts, but they don't mean 
what we mean when we say those words. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit and talk about the differences in these terms and definitions. We'll talk a little bit about the Quran, although really, like I said, you can get lost in the Quran for a long time. There's so much to talk about when it comes to, to the Quran. Also, we'll touch on the Hadith, a, a very, um, a very brief touching on the, the Hadith and what it teaches and some things that you'll find in there. I don't want to get caught up in that either, uh, as it's, you know, it's a nine volume set. There's a lot to say in there. So anyway, what, what is this? What is Islam? Well, you guys all know that it started with Muhammad. Well, I'm not going to get too much into the history here because, again, you could do an entire series on the history of Islam and how it got started. But Muhammad was the guy that got the faith started. Apparently, he claims that he was visited by the angel Gabriel and that uh, the Quran, all these writings in the Quran, the 114 surahs, were written down on tablets of stone in heaven. And Gabriel gave Muhammad the Quran. Okay, so really quick, I just want to point that out. They believe that the Quran was not written by Muhammad. Okay, so just so you know, they believe that the Quran was completely, 100% written by Allah, or sometimes you hear it pronounced Allah. All right, so if you see any verses in the Quran where it's pretty obvious that Muhammad is speaking first person, they would argue, no, that's not Muhammad, even though it's pretty clear that it was Muhammad speaking, but rather it is Allah in heaven who wrote this down on stone and Gabriel delivered it to Muhammad. Okay, Muhammad lived during the 7th century. Uh, he was a merchant who was part of the Quraysh tribe. I might not be pronouncing that correctly. Um, I've only heard um, a few people pronounce that, and I've heard Quraysh and Quraysh. But Quraysh seems to make more sense to me, so we'll, we'll stick with that. He's part of the Quraysh tribe, which is a fairly large tribe. And uh, this tribe at the time uh, was mainly wealthy, although Muhammad's family was not wealthy at all. And uh, the Quraysh tribe was uh, pretty much in control of Mecca. Mecca at the time had over 360 idols in Mecca. And people would show up there, and they had this black box, this huge black cube that uh, literally fell from the sky. It's some kind of uh, chunk of rock from outer space, really, called the Kaaba. Kaaba, uh, however you pronounce that, I apologize. The Kaaba was kind of the, the center attraction. And people would show up. Guys, by the way, mind you, this is pre-Islamic culture I'm talking about. Uh the Quran and the Islamic faith would have you believe that this is what uh, Muhammad got straight from God that they were to do, and this is new revelation from God. But no, this is pre-Islamic culture. People would show up to Mecca, and this can historically be proven uh, without a shadow of a doubt, really. it's I mean, it's absurd to even suggest otherwise. They would march around the Kaaba seven times, then they would kiss the black stone, the cube. That's what Kaaba means, is cube. Uh, and then they would run down to a wadi nearby, and they would throw stones at the devil. And this is exactly what Muslims do today. They have to make a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. That's part of the, the seven pillars of Islam. We'll get into that, too. But they would... Um, this pre-Islamic culture, these Meccans, uh, would all show up. They had 360-some gods there, but the main, most prominent god of the Middle East was, and, it, it, and this god was known by many names, 
but was Allah, the moon god. In fact, the Quraysh tribe worshipped, their, their deity that they worshipped was Allah, okay? It was the moon god. It was a moon deity. And Allah was a male deity. Then there was a female deity, which was the sun god. And Allah and the sun god got together. They had children. They had three daughters, uh, Alat, Al-Uzza, and Manat. Okay, so these three daughters were also worshipped. They were worshipped as kind of like intercessors, kind of like uh, how the Catholic Church views Mary. She's like our intercessor and a lot of the saints. They worship these three daughters as intercessors, uh, and and that was pretty prominent. Now, remember that, because that's going to come in later. Muhammad would get these almost like epileptic epileptic seizures where he would fall to the ground his eyes would roll back into his head uh, and he would twitch and sweat profusely they would cover him up with a blanket and then he would receive these revelations from the angel Gabriel from God basically and they were all written down on, on whatever again whatever was handy at the time so it sometimes it was uh, palm leaves, animal bones, uh, bark off of trees. Sometimes they had paper, papyrus to write on, something. They would write whatever they could. And then sometimes people would just have to commit them to memory. All right, mind you, I just want to mention this. Uh, this Koran is suppo- supposedly written down on tablets in heaven. There are, and this is admittedly so, there are many uh, portions of the Quran, as originally dictated by Muhammad, that never got written down in the Quran. They died with the person that memorized them. As in, this portion was delivered by uh, Muhammad, and because they had nothing to write on, somebody just did their best to memorize it. It never got written down. And when that person died, that portion of what the Quran was supposed to have in it went with them. There are a lot of instances like this. There's also portions of the Quran that, um, well, were edited out. See, I'm already going down a rabbit trail. I wasn't even intending on talking about all this stuff. Yes, there was uh, one of Muhammad's daughters uh, married a man, Uthman. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. <laughs> and this guy, uh, after Muhammad's death, collated, he pulled together all these different Quranic texts, okay, because it still had not been put into one book. And for political reasons, edited out a bunch of parts of the Quran that he didn't like. Now, this is a matter of history, and even Muslim scholars will admit this. Um, The Quran is supposed to be the, you know, perfect, the most perfect book. But here we have a bunch of revelations that Muhammad got that, that, well, quite simply were edited out. And they're gone. Um, The original Quran also had what was called the satanic verses. See, I just keep going. I can't stop. Okay, the original Quran had these satanic verses in them. Some of you have heard of this. Many of you are giving me a blank stare right now. Uh, Mohammed, at one point, well, his family, this Quraysh tribe, his ancestors, they worshipped this moon god, Allah, but they also worshipped the three daughters of Allah, this uh, Alat, Al-Uzza, and Manat. These three daughters, they worship them. Well, Muhammad put in the Quran some verses endorsing the worship and the service to these three daughters, Alat, Al-Uzza, and Manat. And later on, uh, it is claimed that Muhammad was chastised by Allah, and he removed them again, and claimed that they were satanically... uh, influenced that Satan had actually put those in his head. So interesting. 
Interesting stuff, guys. You could talk about the Quran forever. There's so much going on there. So I, I'm going to stop right there. Come out to the website, youthapologeticstraining.com, and there you can leave comments and questions. I do want to talk to you guys. Also, you can catch me on Facebook, Google+, and Twitter. And with that, I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow.